cursed. That's apparently what I am. Or at least that's what my mother postulated when she called me aside over the Christmas holidays. Um, we spent about an hour trying to figure out who in our town of Ikiti in Nigeria could have cursed me so much. Um, as, a, as, the, um, or, as already mentioned, I'm a trainee helicopter pilot, I'm a doctor, and I'm the founder and managing director of West Africa's first indigenous air ambulance service, which is responsible for moving hundreds of patients from areas where they've overwhelmed the level of care to more suitable levels of care for them. But I'm still cursed because I'm 28 years old and I'm not married. One of my very good friends in Nigeria is also in the healthcare space, and um, her job is to um, organize free healthcare. Um, she does that by running clinics, and she does that by doing healthcare organizational walks um, and bringing doctors and nurses from abroad into Nigeria to perform minor operations. Um, she's also a political activist. And um, her work is very admirable, and her NGO is probably one of the largest of its kind in West Africa. Um, but I was talking about her work, sat in Lagos with some friends, and um, one of the gentlemen that I was speaking about her work with um, called her a slut, because she has um, children with a man that she's not married to. So all of her work, everything she's ever stood for, all the lives that she's touched, all the lives that she's saved, have been summarized in a single word, slut. A few months ago, I was privileged to uh, speak at Wimby's, which is the Women in Business organization in Nigeria. Um, it's probably the foremost um, women's group in Nigeria, encouraging young girls and um, older women to look into business opportunities, to look into management, and to look into careers in public service. And some of the top women in all three sectors are members of Wimby. So I was really, really honored that they invited me um, to speak at their lunch. But as I was leaving um, my office, one of my male employees asked me how I cope with this women's group, because they tend to be quite petty and jealous and gossip. Right now in Nigeria, we're having an election, and in every single local government area in Nigeria, there are men gathering together to be jealous of each other and to gossip and to figure out ways to bring each other down. Um, but when men do it, it's ambitious. When women do it, it's called petty. I don't know why it seems that we make these very, very human traits of jealousy and the tendency to pull each other down sometimes, female traits instead of just human traits. Another one of my friends in Nigeria just took over the family business, and she has a a similar leadership style, I would say, to her dad. They like results, and they like things done right. But whereas her dad was always called a visionary leader when he was in charge of the company, she's always called bossy. Every single one of her employees that I speak to calls her bossy. I wonder why, for very, very similar traits, her dad was applauded as a visionary, decisive leader, and she gets tagged with bossy, nagging. Um, I also belong to a church group, and um, we occasionally do a bit of counseling between um, couples who have fallen out, and the major, major complaint I get from boyfriends and from husbands is that women are always nagging. And I hate this term, because there is no male equivalent 
to the stereotypical nagging wife. The term nagging manages to do three things simultaneously, I think. It manages to trivialize a woman's re request completely, and then it puts them firmly in their place, i.e., you can't make a request. And then it also makes sure that it removes any responsibility from the man to follow up on that request. You see, women nag. Men make requests. Or in Nigeria, they issue executive orders that must be obeyed. And when a man makes a request for me, for example, I have the, I have the immediate tendency to want to fix it like most women. I go on Google and start looking about how can I, can be, how can I be better, th um, better at this. He's just told me this, I've got the information, so now I need to put it into action and maybe make a small plan about how I can get better at it and look better or feel better or do something that he wants better. And I even ad companies now, even when I'm Googling medical terms, because I Google so much of my neurotic terms, the ads come up. So even if I'm Googling something as simple as treatment of tension pneumothorax in a helicopter, there's always an ad on the side now because if they've seen a pattern at Google that says, oh, how to be a perfect girlfriend, download this book for $10.99. And apparently, I'm not the only one. When you Google how to be a good wife, there are 70 million returns. Now, just hazard a guess at how many returns you get when you Google books on how to be a good husband. How many people would guess, okay, a bit less, let's say 50 million? Okay, anybody would say half, 35 million. Half is fair. 35 million? Yeah, there's a few takers for 35 million. 17 million. So that means there are almost four to five times as many women searching for information on how to be a good wife than there are men searching for how to be a good woman. Yet, we're the ones that nag. And why is this so? I think it's because of the stories that we tell ourselves. When you think about who narrates the world, which is an interesting question. I think men narrate the world. Almost 80% of all the media we consume, be it in newspapers, radio, or television, is created from men and narrated from the male standpoint. Nearly 80% of people that sit on panels or give talks or are called experts are men. Men are experts on everything, from medicine, to global health, to science, to architecture, to how women should dress, to how women should wear their hair, to even women's health and women's choices with what they do with their bodies. This is a picture from the American Congress in 2012, and it's a panel of five men being sworn in as experts on contraception. Fifty percent of the world's population are women, yet only 16 percent occupy any sort of political position. So we have half of the population, but only 16 percent of the voice. In terms of global labor, we do 70 percent of the work in the world, but only receive 10 percent of the income and only own 1% of the means of production. One in three women is likely to be raped or abused in her lifetime. And how do we talk about the few powerful women that we have that aren't these statistics, that have managed to break through those glass ceilings and become powerful women? We call them angry. We call them aggressive, we call them pushy, we call them slutty, we call them bossy, we call them scary, we call them frumpy, 
We call them annoying. We call them unreasonable. We call them crazy. Do you know that in some areas in Africa, there are only two doctors to every 100,000 people, compared to 32 doctors per 100,000 people in Europe? That's why it really, really surprises me when I see the number of men all over the world that are willing to become qualified psychiatrists when it comes to calling women crazy. I, went, I grew up in a small town in England, and um, I was the only black person in my school. So my school picture had this ocean of white and then one brown spot in the middle, that was me. So I used to get called names, they used to call me dirty because they thought the brown color should have washed off. And um, one day when I was crying because I didn't want to go to school, my mom told me that name calling is something that children do when they meet somebody that's so special and so unique that it scares them. I would consider that that's probably why adults call people names as well. Now, um, a lot of theories say that women aren't suitable for leadership. Maybe we're too emotional and irritable to make decisions. But according to this McKinsey study, it found that women have five out of nine leadership behaviors that improve organizational performance. The trends are changing. Currently, 30% of homes in the UK now have a female breadwinner. And over half, or nearly half, of the wealth held in the UK is now held by women. 85% of global consumption is done by women. And Shinzo Abe, the president of Japan, has um, an economic theory for improving growth in Japan, and it's called Abenomics. And he famously said that Abenomics will not be possible without womenomics. In fact, he estimates that by attracting more women into the Japanese economy, into leadership positions, he can raise Japan's GDP by over 10%. These are some of the most powerful women in Nigeria. Our Minister for Petroleum, our Minister for Finance, and Ms. Moabudu, who is the first Nigerian female owner of a TV station. And while these pictures are up, I'd like to speak to every woman in the audience. When I started my company, I was really, really scared of being called names. And I feel that the women that have gone before me, like these women um, that I've put up here, have been called every single name under the sun in Nigeria. They've been called slutty and angry and frumpy and irritable. And because they've been called all these names, I feel like I've been called those names a little bit less. And I feel like if more women could feel that fear, but do it anyway, but take those leadership positions anyway, perhaps our daughters might not be called any names at all. And we can't do this, we can't build this change without the help of men as well. And I already know lots of men that refuse to speak on expert panels and refuse to sit on boards of directors without first asking why there are no female representatives on these boards. And I think that if every man could just, men, men and women in fact, could just pause before they use some of these negative words, like slutty, like crazy, like irrational, like bossy, then perhaps we could create some sort of cultural change where Women are less uh, where women are less subjugated. And if there are fewer people looking down on women, perhaps we could prevent one rape or one case of abuse. 
And I know these seem like very small steps, and I'm sure a lot of you are wondering that can these small things really create change? But I think that small steps taken by large numbers of people are the only thing that has ever created change. So um, I think quite a few people in this audience have gotten some champagne. Um, in Nigeria, as is tradition at Christmas, I spend a lot of time going around my different clients around Lagos, Fort Court, and Abuja, hand, um, handing out these bottles of champagne. And it occurred to me this Christmas that I'd never actually tasted it before. So um, I'd like all of the people that have champagne in the audience to raise your glasses to a fairer world a world with less rape, a world with less abuse, a world where I can get married when I'm in love, not because I'm wondering about where to get the money for my next haircut. A more prosperous world, a more creative world, and a more innovative world for everyone. That's definitely an idea worth drinking to. Thank you.